Well, good evening, everyone. I'm PJ O'Neill, the branch assistant for STEM training and youth programs in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and welcome to this month's Tech Talk all about GPS. Tech Talks are held on the fourth Tuesday of each month at 2100 hours Eastern time. Tech Talks are sponsored by the U.S. Coast Guard, Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America Sea Scout Program. For our topic tonight covering GPS, we have longtime instructors in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, Dane Hahn and Doug Legit. I hope that you will enjoy tonight's session, learn a lot, and keep in mind that August's topic on 23rd August will be paddle craft hazards. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Doug to start us off with an introduction to GPS. All right, thank you very much and good evening. So we're gonna talk about GPS. It's everywhere these days. We're gonna start off with just a little bit of history and background on some of the uh, systems that preceded GPS, give you a little background there. And then uh, Dane Hahn will be picking up and talking about GPS in particular. So what we're gonna to learn tonight is a history of electronic position systems. And that includes the uh, development of LoRaN in World War II. And we're gonna talk about the rise and the demise of LoRaN-C, which came after the initial LoRaN system. And now we have a new system that may be coming online soon. It's called eLoRaN. So that's a little bit of the history of LoRaN. Then we're going to talk about global positioning systems, which is the GPS system and how it works. And then we're going to add electronic charts to GPS and talk about a chart plotter, which is the modern way that we utilize GPS on the water. Talk about types of GPS receivers. Talk about a buyer's guide to GPS. And talk about some practical GPS navigation tips. And there may be a special feature coming up about GPS plotters. We'll see how that works out tonight. So in the pre-1940s navigation, it was all done using a sextant, which was this nice instrument here. Many of you may have seen that. You may have used it. And here's a little old handheld type. But it used and took fixes through the sun and stars and plotted it out on paper charts. During the 1940s, LoRaN was developed and used paper charts also. And this was some of the early LoRaN equipment. In 1973, GPS was developed and brought online. And in 1983, the chart plotter was invented and it merged GPS and electronic charts, which is the way we see it most of the time in modern environment. So back in the day, Mariners have always needed to know where they were, which way they needed to go to get where they wanted to be. So how do we find out where you are on a map or a chart? And what direction will get you to the desired destination? Well, we can use electronic navigation means to answer these questions. So LORAN, long range navigation, it's just an abbreviation, but that's what it amounts to is long range navigation, LORAN. It's an electronic navigation system developed during World War II using low frequency radio to deploy to US ships, convoys crossing the Atlantic. It had a range up to 1500 miles. And it may seem strange, but it had an accuracy of tens of miles which in today's environment seems awfully far out. But when you're crossing the Atlantic in World War II, if you knew where you were within tens of miles, you were in pretty good position. And this is what the early LoRaN receivers looked like. Pretty basic looking, a lot of development. So next came LoRaN C, and that was just a modernized version of LoRaN. And it was launched in 1958, managed by the Coast Guard. Its accuracy was typically from 60 to 300 feet. 
And this is a picture of what the Lorraine receiver, C, the Lorraine C receivers look like. Some of you may have seen these. Navigators still had to interpret blue, magenta, black, and green lines that were overprinted on the nautical charts they were using. So this is your typical looking chart. It shows water depths, it shows lighthouses, it shows the buoy systems, and then a whole bunch of lines on it here. And these are your Loran sea lines, and they used to have Loran stations that were sending out radio waves and your receiver would pick them up and they would try and interpret those. So this is kind of a blow up of that chart I just showed you. And these magenta figures in here are what you would receive on your Lorian C receiver. And you would plot those points on your chart. So if you were halfway between say this point and this point, you were halfway between 41,320 and 41,330, you would know that you, if you receiver said you were at 41,225, you know you were about halfway in between these blocks and you could cross-reference these both longitude and latitude. So it was a nice grid. It helped you find out where you were. Over the years, Lorraine C became the most common and widely used navigation system for large areas of North America, Europe, Japan, entire Atlantic and Pacific areas. Very popular, it was a, a great advancement in electronic navigation. But what happened to it? We don't hear much about it anymore. Well, GPS came along and it was implemented. So in May of 2009, then President Obama declared Lorraine C system was obsolete and announced plans that they would terminate it. In October of that year, Congress finally enacted an appropriations measure allowing Lorraine C termination and the Coast Guard began shutting it down in February of 2010. So Lorraine C is replaced by GPS. So what does GPS do? Well, satellites use accurate time and distance measurements to determine latitude and longitude for any point on Earth. Paper charts are still required to navigate from one known location to another. So remember the GPS receivers only plot latitude and longitude, but they don't tell us where we're going. We can't plot with them. The early ones only gave that latitude and longitude data. And you can see their cost was $2,999 for this little handheld item, which had a nice little antenna on it. So they weren't very popular at that time. Now we have them in automobiles. We have them on marine ways. They're in your cell phones. They're on hiking things. This is, I have a little e-trex that I've used for years and it plots where I am whenever I'm out hiking in the woods or on any other area. They're in your tablets and they're in aircraft. So everywhere and everybody is using GPS. How does it work? It uses a network of orbiting satellites. It's based on a precise and signal timing basis. So we have the earth and we have all of these satellites that are in different positions as they orbit around the earth. Our receivers are looking for signals and the satellite selection is an automatic thing. We don't have to try and choose which satellites they're going to pick up. If they can gather up and get a signal from four satellites, they have a high degree of accuracy. If you get three satellites, you got a degraded signal, but it is still operational. If you can't pick up at least three satellites, then you're not going to get a good position and it's not going to be a worthwhile item to have available. So this is what it would look like if we had four and their overlapping signals would pinpoint us right to a certain point on the earth where the receiver is picking up the information. GPS was developed by the Air Force 
It became fully operational in the mid 90s. It had worldwide coverage, but it had poor penetration of buildings, boat cabins and foliage. So you had to be careful what you did. And a lot of our GPS units had external antennas that gave us good reception where we had our receivers were inside some um, build, uh, building or boat cabin or something like that. Or with the handheld ones, if you're under heavy trees cover, you're not gonna get good reception from the satellites. So what we have is GPS satellites are sending down data. We have a network of monitoring stations across the country here. And we came up with another system which augmented the GPS. It's called Wide Area Augmentation or WAS. And what it did, it took the data from these satellites. It took it over here to a sending station and they uplinked a correction table to a WAS satellite. This one happens to be in the Atlantic. There was another one in the Pacific. The WAS Atlantic in this case, then downlinked the corrected information to wherever the receiver was. So without the WAS system, your uh, accuracy was about 30 feet or less. But when the wide augmentation system was activated, you could bring it down to 10 feet or less. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you're talking about being on a 25 foot vessel, 10 feet or less means you can be right in the middle of your boat and tell you exactly where that part of your boat is located. Very accurate system. So what is ahead? Well, the problem with GPS, as we talked about already, it does have some vulnerability because it can, the signal can be deleted by buildings being inside boats or foliage. There is also a problem with unintentional or intentional radio frequency interference known as jamming. Have problems with people that are spoofing the system, creating false signals. Solar flares will affect the GPS system. There's accidental destruction of satellites by space debris. And you take out a couple of your GPS satellites and you're gonna lose your great, the uh, quality of your signal. And intentional destruction may be there in an act of war. Uh, just recently, I believe one of our Russian systems actually took out one of their own satellites in a test just to see if they could do it by well, shooting a missile at it. So eLoran is now being looked at, it's an enhanced LoRAN, and it's one of several positioning, navigation, and timing systems, and they're termed PNT systems, proposed as a backup for GPS. So the output of an eLoRAN receiver is very similar to that of a GPS receiver. It doesn't have quite the same accuracy. It can be 60 feet, in some cases down to 30 feet, but it is a very reliable system. It's based on a low frequency radio wave operating in the frequency band of 90 kilohertz to 110 kilohertz. At that low band, it's, it has very good range. It has good stability and you have a good chance of making it work. And this is what the new receivers would look like for e Loran. very compact, simplified little box. The signals from an ELORAN beacon are considerably stronger than those from GPS satellites. So any attempts to jam or spoof LORAN would most likely fail. And it's also a much more resilient system than GPS because it's working on radio waves and it's a lot harder to knock the system out. We don't have to worry about taking out satellites. You're more affected on the ground itself. So is eLoran our next nav system? Well, we're not sure. It's tough for any solution to compete with a GPS as a backup because GPS is free and implementing these new systems are very expensive. So this story's ending is still to be determined. And now we're gonna turn over to Dane and he's gonna to talk to us about GPS. And we've been talking about GPS, uh, but um, let's see where I am here. <laughs> uh, we have been talking about GPS, so I'm going to be talking more about chart plotters. 
Hold on a second while I, while I dig up my uh, actual presentation. Hmm. So while he's doing that, if anybody had any questions, we'd be glad to try and answer them. So while Dane's looking, uh, yeah, Dane's perhaps looking. yeah, a question um, that, that comes up is, um, you know, so the, the satellites that we get GPS fixes from, uh, are they government satellites? Are they private commercial satellites? Is it a, a mix? What are we relying on in, in terms of, of the satellites? Uh, that's a good question. And I believe they're a, a mix, but the, the main ones that we're utilizing in our system uh, in the United States were put up by the United States government. But there, there are some other systems. Uh, I believe the Chinese have their own system mm. activated using satellites. So um, what we're really talking about are, are ones that most of our Eastern, uh, Western countries are using. We're going good, Dane? Uh, we're having fun here. <laughs> What I'm having, the problem that I'm having is that I've got it open, but I can't get it to come forward. So this, well, there it is. Okay, I'm good. All right. Okay, so that's about where we left off. So pardon me for, for not having that ready to go. Um, but now we can. So I just need to move this one bar out of my way so I can see what I'm doing. So a little history on... Um, on chart plotters, um, in 1983, uh, a um, very wealthy uh, mariner uh, ordered a mega yacht uh, from um, a, a, a manufacturer over in Europe, and uh, Giuseppe Carnavali and Fosco uh, Bianchetti were assigned uh, to fulfill his wildest dream, which was a chart plotter. Uh, and so because they had all this money behind them for this monster mega yacht, they were able to have the resources to create the chart plotter. And the two of them um, got into business together after, after this all happened. Um, and um, the partnership, though, was uh, short-lived. Uh, Bianchetti left the business and founded CMAP, which is a name that probably many people have heard. Um, CMAP continues to make maps. Uh, it's an electronic mapping service, and it's been sold to Jeppesen. Carnavali ran the company, um, continued to run the company, and they called it Navonix. Uh, and finally, he sold Navonix to Garmin. So the Garmin uh, chart plotters that we know and love uh, are all related back to these two guys. Um, and um, so a little bit more. Uh, about these things, and, uh, and I think that I don't know if their names will come up again, but I think you may see that chart plotter again. So there are three different categories of, of uh, GPS units uh, that uh, that we talk about from from marine use. There's the handheld uh, units, which um, the, the the smallest ones have many of the same features. The the bigger handheld units, and these are pocket sized mostly, big pockets, but still. Uh, has a, a lot of the main features, including color screen. Of course, the screens are small because the units are small, uh, but uh, you can get a lot of the of the um, of the bells and whistles, all the good stuff, um, even in the small ones. Then there's the next size up, which is uh, uh, kind of designed as fixed mount. These are these are fully mounted on a boat, but they're easy to take off. In other words, the the mounting is a kind of a it's 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 bolted into the dashboard, let's say, but the but the actual GPS snaps into the into this mounting, and then there's the permanent mount. So these are the these are the pocket size. Some of them uh, pretty much have data only. Uh, others of them have little screens, and then some of them even have color screens. So these are the uh, these are the pocket size units. Okay. These would be the ones that I'm speaking of that uh, are mounted. Uh, and um, I don't know if any of, uh, of our audience uh, is in the market to buy a unit, but these units, the pocket-sized ones, 
will run from the high 100s on up to probably nine, 900 or thereabouts. These, of course, will start maybe more like 300 and work their way up. Uh, and then we have, and this is the way they mount, or this is one, this particular Lawrence mount, mounts this way. Um, so you can see that he can remove this, the skipper can remove this and take it home. He doesn't have to worry about somebody stealing it or it being out in the weather or whatever like that. Then there are the permanent mounts. This is a permanent mount. Um, and these you're looking here uh, at units that are around $10,000. Uh, and what's happening in the system like this is that really uh, what you have here are a couple of TV screens. And there's a great deal more equipment inside the dashboard, which can include radar and it can include bathospheric photography and it can also include aerial photography. A lot of different things. Pretty much you're going to have all the bells and whistles and they and um, Garmin for one uh, makes these things. These are not Garmin units, but Garmin makes these with a daisy chain system. So, you know, if you can't afford everything the first year, you just next year you buy you buy the next little uh, sending unit and it just plugs in. They're, they're all, they call them daisy chains because they all link together. So one thing about, uh, about GPSs is that there's a, they have a cold start and a warm start. And let me say, a cold start, um, it, the reason that a cold start it occurs is if a GPS has not been used for several months or it's the first time it's been turned on, or it's been moved significantly since it was last used. So what you're asking this little system to do, this little this little box to do, is you know get out there and find the satellites. And you're not even sure which satellites you're looking for, so just get out there and look for satellites. And so it may take up to 20 minutes. Uh, but if you buy one of these things, that's the first thing you need to know. When you when you turn it on, it may not light right up. However, once it's been on and you haven't moved it in any particular location. It remembers the satellites that it had the last time and it will be ready pretty quickly. So it's just one of those things where it's kind of a wake up uh, and it takes it maybe some amount of time to wake up, uh, just, to, just to be aware of that. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the screens. Um, the satellite screen, this is the satellite screen that you're looking at. Um, and this is, this is actually four different satellite screens. Um, so this is from one manufacturer, this one's from a different one, this is from a third, and this is from the fourth, okay? Satellite screen is usually the first one to appear when you power up the system um, because um, you need to confirm that the GPS has acquired enough satellites to get a fix before using it. So this is what, the, what you're seeing. I'm going to talk about this one that's got the, got, actually got the words on it. Uh, but here's the sky view, and the system, as, the, as it finds these, they light up and, they, and it knows where they are. It also knows how strong the signal is from each one of those. So here would be uh, signal bars from the satellites. Um, it knows uh, what, th this is, says the GPS status, a, um, a 3D system indicates that you have actually four satellites that are all working accurately. Uh, and then we have other information. Speed, there's no speed because we're not indicating any, any um, motion. Um, elevation, uh, here's accuracy. Now the accuracy um, goes up and down based on the, satel the satellite signal bars. So if the signal bars are much lower than this, or if the WAS that Doug recently spoke about, if the WAS system uh, sometimes is turned off, the accuracy will diminish when that happens. In this particular case, this is the date and time uh, that, uh, so it was the 22nd of February, and here's the time and so forth. And then this is the coordinates of the position where it is. And it could be on your desk. You know, it all depends on, on what you, um, where you, where you first turned it on. Uh, so it will give you, it'll give you your uh, latitude and longitude. Um, you need to check this screen back and forth occasionally uh, to be sure that you have good accuracy. Uh, that's, you know, because if you never look at this screen, 
you may not realize that you don't you don't have four satellites or three satellites. Okay, so this is the chart screen. Um, this is going to show you this is now this is four different screens from four different units. This is not one unit coming up with these different um, kinds of screens. So bear in mind that when you go to buy uh, a GPS or when you when you advise somebody about what GPS to buy, that even though they all will have a chart screen, the chart screens are all going to look a little bit different. So I'm staying with the ones that have the, 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 the uh, words and arrows on them just to make it simple. But you can let your eyes wander over to these others. Some of them have really nice, really nice uh, charts on them. So the, the chart screen isn't going to work for you unless you have an active waypoint um, already programmed into it. In other words, when you just turn it on, it doesn't know which way you want to go. So it, it doesn't know which part of the chart to put in. You, you need to add a few things. Uh, the, the nice thing about, um, about these is they come with a very thick manual. Uh, and you'll have to enjoy your time with the manual in order to learn to use it. But this is this what this box is showing us, what this screen is showing us is that the active waypoint, which is the next point that you have chosen to go to from where you are now, um, is Point Isabel. Okay, and then these are data screens. So it, it's it'll it'll tell you that you're going 30 miles an hour. Th I'm sorry, 30 knots. Um, and uh, you go, you're going northeast, and the distance to the waypoint is 6.1 nautical miles. Here's your position. This is the position of the cursor. Okay, so here's the cursor down here. Um, so we, you know, this is this is the position of the cursor, and this is this is your current position. Here's the screen, the chart screen itself. There's a distance scale here, and a distance in bearing to the cursor will tell you how far it is. Well, that's that screen. Now the compass screen. The compass screen is is a little different, and it's uh, it will give you uh, well, it will give you what you ask for. If you want, if you want uh, magnetic north, or if you want um, uh, true north, you can you can set the compass for either either one for which you choose. The the compass also uh, requires. Uh, uh, that you're moving in order that the, the, it, the uh, pointer knows which way to point. Um, so, and it gets that by seeing where it is and now where it is again and where it is again and where it is again. If you're just loafing along or, or worse, um, drifting, uh, it'll, it'll just be spinning around back and forth. It won't, it won't know where it is. So there's that to remember. Um, if you're not moving, the GPS will not provide an accurate compass heading. Some newer GPS units have the built-in magnetic sensors, uh, and that is probably helpful. But again, uh, it's only accurate if you're moving at the moment. Okay, so we'll get on to the, the next one, the highway screen. Um, this also requires an active waypoint, uh, but it will show you what's going on. So here is your highway and here's your boat and this boat was showing that it's moving toward the waypoint which is a, a, a benefit. Uh, we're getting data screens here so the speed is nine nautical knots or knots I guess I should say um, and the distance to the next waypoint is a half a nautical mile. Uh, the ETA at the destination is in uh, nine minutes and ten seconds uh, and uh, next the time to to the next mark is 319, so there's that. And these again are two other um, similar screens from other manufacturers. Um, the highway screen again requires act, an active waypoint. As long as the vessel is kept in the middle of the road, it will, um, it will reach the, the selected waypoint. Um, if additional waypoints have been entered, it will it, the system will uh, see that as a course and it will go waypoint to waypoint to waypoint. Um, Mariners will be using this kind of a um, screen 
to stay on course. Deviation from a desired course is immediately apparent. Um, and all three GPS devices on this screen are represented. Um, note the screen in the upper left shows a cross track error. Uh, and I think that is this, this little box here. I can't tell you exactly what the error is, but that's just something worth knowing. This is um, the course itself, or this highway, the highway screen itself. And so this is what you want to see. You want to know that your waypoint is up here, your boat is aimed at it, and you're on course. If you have drifted or been blown, let's say, by wind um, off course, what this is what an off course screen would look like. You're still aimed toward the waypoint, directly at the waypoint, but you're not on the course that you have previously set. Uh, and we'll get to why that can be dangerous in just a moment. Um, here is a heading. Um, you, now, you, now the boat is heading in, in an off course direction. So this is what that screen would look like for you. Um, but a quick, a quick glance at this screen will tell you what si your situation is. And that's a big advantage of being able to check these screens once in a while. Okay, this is the trip computer screen. Um, and again, I should probably say that all GPSs have these screens and you just need to know how to access them. And they're all a little bit different, but they all have similar information. When you set up your, comp your, um, your uh, chart plotter for the first time, uh, or any time really, uh, you, can add, you can put in here what you want it to, to have, what information you want it to, to have. So you, you may prefer the data fields that are not here but are available, that sort of thing. This is giving us uh, the, the trip and maximum speed that has been made good, the average speed that was made good, and travel and stop time. So this is a 47-hour trip, uh, and the moving time is only 2 hours and 18 minutes. So it's like a weekend away, and you didn't go that far. You were at anchor or tied up. Uh, for, you know, 46 hours, uh, just to, to give you an idea uh, of, of what that says. This is tides, um, and most GPS units today have tide and current tables in their internal database. And what it's going to show you is uh, how the, what's going on with the tide over time. So here's the time bar here. Here's the high tide, low tide, high tide, that kind of thing. It tells you what tide station uh, this information is for and the date. Uh, and then it gives you the times till high tide, times to time of high tide, time of low tide. So that's, that's, that's the tide screen. These are some screens too that, um, will show, that show you uh, in a, in a, um, in a touch uh, screen, you may have these kinds of choices. So here would be the compass screen, uh, here's the trip computer screen, here's the map or chart screen, and so forth, all of that. And you just touch touch the button, that's what will come up. The, the smaller, less, um, uh, less high tech would have a, a, a pointer of some kind and you can, you pick what you want, you just light it up, what you want to see, or you'd be scrolling for it, that sort of thing. So this is just a question of Similar things, different prices. Now, here's a situation where you've got the chart up, and on the chart is your course, okay? And you have uh, made some, something has happened that has made you go off course. This is your new current position. This is where you thought you were. Okay, so looking at these other uh, screens, we can see here's, here's the... Um, uh, here's, here's our um, highway screen uh, and th this shows where we are and it shows also where your goal was or the mark and this was the course you were going to take. So you can see how far off course you are and here again you can see that you're off course as well. Um, this gives us the information on the satellites and so forth. Everything's good but now we have, a, we have our um, we have our latitude and longitude here, so we know where we are 
and this this is where we are. So, um, should we just go straight to it, just right on up to the destination? Uh, or maybe we should look back here and see that there's only one foot of depth through this whole shoal. This is a great big shallow area. And if you just decide to continue to the destination, you will run aground thanks to this particular um, GPS, which we would be perfectly happy to take you across an island uh, or any other kind of um, land because it really only sees where you are and where your destination is. Doesn't have any idea what's going on in between. So what do you do when you find yourself in a situation like this? Well, um, the smart money says the f you, you don't retrace your steps back. You regain your course as quickly as possible. In this case, you're not that far off course. So it's just a hard left hand turn. Uh, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to make a hard left hand turn. We're going to come back to course and then we're going to recorrect and continue on our way up to our next mark. Okay, so we because we know this is a safe, a safe line. So those are just a few things that you need to bear in mind. Um, here again, this is the same, a, a same or similar situation. Um, and uh, what's happened is a strong wind here has driven this boat, which was minding its own business and going perfectly north, and it's blown it off course. And that's, that's the system, that's the situation. So one of the reasons why you don't only use the compass uh, in your GPS is because your compass in the GPS isn't going to tell you that there are rocks here. It's going to say go this way or go this way. Um, and so if you change and follow what it says to do, you can put yourself in jeopardy. So well enough about that. Okay, now this is some information uh, on here uh, that you, you can get this information using your cursor. Uh, and this is on the on the big uh, on the big screen when once you've got it up, depending on your unit. Um, in this particular case, it's this little area here on the corner of Cape Cod that's been lit up, and what we're getting here is the uh, buoy information, um, uh, the, and what kind of uh, audio, uh, uh, what kind of sounds are being made, what what the um, blinking and beeping and so forth um, are. Uh, but more than that, you can uh, you can stop on on a marina and find out if they sell gasoline. You can find out if they have a restaurant. These are uh, these these um, charts that they're putting into the into these units now um, will give you a, a great deal more information than any paper chart ever did. Okay, here are um, a number of alarms that are available. This is not all of them, but there are five here, and we'll talk about them briefly. Um, this, is, this is your final uh, destination waypoint here. And so, you, uh, before you get to it, you have marked uh, on this destination waypoint a circle. You don't have to draw the circle. You just tell the, the uh, chart plotter how what the radius of the circle is. So it could be a quarter mile, half a mile, whatever, and that makes a pretty big circle. So when you arrive in the circle, you get an alarm, lets you know that you are nearly there, you have arrived. Um, and so this destination waypoint could be, um, it could be a, 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 um, a lighthouse. And you don't really want to arrive at the lighthouse, you want to arrive in an area, vicinity near the lighthouse, because arriving at the lighthouse would clearly be a problem uh, for you. Um, you can also set on your course, here's your course set from starting waypoint to destination waypoint, the width of the, of, call it the channel. Uh, so if you go outside of this channel or outside of this area that you have delineated, you will get an alarm. So that's a kind of a, a way to keep your attention as to where it is that you're going. These circles are pretty easy to set too. And, and uh, here's an anchor circle. So you, when you um, drop your anchor back down to an area where you're comfortable uh, and set the, set the anchor so everything's fine, 
you can set an alarm right then um, saying that if we drift more than, let's say, 200 feet in either direction, um, in any direction, I want an alarm and and you can do it and it will set the it will the alarm will sound if you get anywhere out anytime uh, you get into this uh, magenta area the alarm will go off stay in the blue it'll be quiet okay all right here's proximity now you can set up a proximity wall around shoals if you want to so you can be having a great old time and if you get near a shoal, um, and that can be a sandbar, it could be rocks, it could be whatever it is that you've decided. When you get near enough to it, your alarm will go off. And that's that's a sort of a, hey, wake up, you know, take a look at your chart, see where you are. And the same here is true. Um, this this side is depth. Um, this one, this particular alarm sees uh, that the, that the, you know, you mark this off, but it sees if you get into shallow water, it wants an alarm. So those are those are some of them. Of course, um, there are other markers that you can set, not just uh, waypoints, but uh, man overboards and things of that nature. Um, sometimes you, people use a man overboard alarm when their hat blows off because they want to know where it blew off so they can go back and get it. Uh, and it doesn't have to be quite as serious as a human being overboard. Okay, so the vector charts that I was just talking about they have more information than a paper chart. You can zoom in and out on them. They're not, you know, not like a paper chart. To zoom means you've got to bring it up closer to your eyes. Uh, and these, you make them bigger. And it's always going to be in focus and always readable, regardless of the zoom level. Also, there's additional data that can be associated with specific map features. For example, light and sound characteristics on aids to navigation can be shown. Um, and, you know, one other bonus, the text is all, always right side up. So, um, now some of the special features, well, the electronic charts, many of them, uh, depending on the unit you buy, you can buy them built in or you can buy uh, charts to put into your unit. Uh, they have a large, generally a bright color screen and can be a large one as well. Um, most of them will integrate with other vessel systems, depth finder, fish finder, um, radar, things of that nature. You can do a, a overlay with Google Earth. Uh, that you, you take that right down. Well, actually, you can download Google Earth into into um, a store on a onto a storage um, drive or whatever, and then you have full access uh, to uh, satellite imagery. You have aerial photographs that you can download as well and bat, uh, bath, uh, bath met, metric screens, which um, if you don't know, but that makes a picture that looks like the bottom of the sea. It's as though all the water has been removed and now you can see how deep it is in certain areas and how shallow it is in other areas, big rocks wrecks on the bottom, all that sort of thing will show up on a bathymetric screen. A radar overlay uh, will also, or, or it will go alongside actually, give you a radar on one panel and then you've got the chart panel as well. So you can, by looking at the chart panel and then over at the radar, you can see where the other mar marine traffic is, where other boats are. Um, if there are boats that are anchored in the channel ahead, uh, and that sort of thing, you, you can see where they are from a distance. The automatic identification system on, the, on larger vessels, the AIS system, um, will tell you uh, what boat that is uh, and, um, you know, the name of it, who owns it, uh, how long it is, that sort of thing. So if it's a tanker or a freighter, anything like that, AIS system has it. And you can play videos on it. Like I said earlier, these are like television sets. They really just communicate a visual to you. So you can put anything you want through them. Okay, here's an aerial photograph. Um, in this uh, bathymetric screen, you, you kind of have an idea of, the, of what's going on with the depths in, uh, in a harbor like that uh, or in, a, in an area like this. 
Um, here's a radar overlay. Like I said, this is the radar. This is the chart. Um, these, this is a split screen, but it works fine. Uh, and here's a video uh, of uh, somebody, I don't know, throwing, throwing uh, a net out perhaps. So anyway, um, now there are other ways to, to uh, get the information that a chart plotter will give you without actually buying a chart plotter. Um, but you need to be a techie. The programs, there are programs that will work on your laptop or on a tablet or even on a cell phone and they're available and they're not terribly expensive. Um, the, you can find them um, in boating magazines, you can find them just online. Uh, they do have true navigational functionality, but let me say that uh, although they do all these things and experts expect that they'll have even more expanded capability in the future, the off-the-shelf computers and tablets and so forth that can be integrated into the vessel state of communication network uh, may work very well, but they're not um, designed for anybody but the high techies. Uh, they're really you know, pieced together. And so you may enjoy doing something with them as a hobby, but let me say that you're, you're not going to have the slick little mounts that uh, fit right on your dashboard. You're going to have a you know, a, uh, a tablet that's going to be sliding around on the dashboard. You're going to be, you're going to be using the duct tape and Velcro to keep the thing where you want it. Uh, so it may not be exactly uh, what you hoped it would be, but it'll be a lot cheaper and it might be fun. So um, these are not for the non-technical boater. Okay, so a chart plotter uh, is a true navigational aid and will augment navigating with charts. There are many different types of devices to choose from, um, and there, there are many that compete with each other. So you decide what your needs are, and then, then match your purchase to your needs. Uh, because you, you, if you wind up getting something that's got every bell and whistle, um, you're going to spend a ton of money. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't get what you need, you'll be disappointed with what you've paid for. So to get the most out of your GPS, read the instructions and practice until you're proficient. Uh, I know this has been a kind of a brief chatter about what's in there, uh, but the bottom line is it, it, they're, they're different. They're the same enough so we can talk about them as a group, but they're different enough so that when you decide with, on one, you're going to want to really study up on the one that you bought. So and remember to cross check your GPS position frequently. Okay, so that wraps this part up. Now I've got a little um, buying um, uh, package that uh, came from Garmin and I, I'd like to show it now, but again, I'm going to have to excuse myself and go back and get it. Um, I think, let me just see for a second if it isn't handy here. I've got to dump the full screen to see what I'm doing. And I, it won't go away. Um, so, just as while you're checking for the, uh, for your Garmin, uh, buying package, um, a couple interesting facts came up in chat here that GPS was transferred from the Air Force to the Space Force when Space Force, uh, became, uh, became a branch of the Armed Forces, which is pretty interesting. And that's and it makes sense the last year. Yeah, you know, that's, yeah that's, this is yeah. really new stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I'm afraid I can't get back to the to that uh, file. I don't know why not. Oh, maybe I do now. We'll see. OK, yes, I can do it, I think. Let's see if I can make this pop up. Is that? Can people see we that? Can, we can hear it, but not see it. You can't see it? No. Okay. But we hear it. It's, yeah, okay. That Well, it's hard not to hear this thing. It's very lively. Um, how am I going to make this work is my next question. Um, oh, I know, because I stopped sharing my screen, and now I don't have a bar to do that. So I'm going to get back here and, and light this back up. Okay.
I think I, I think I got it here. All right, we see some piles here, West Marine Buyer's Guides. Okay, what do you see him? Is that working? No, nothing okay. just don't have anything else. No video. Hi, Chuck Hawley from West Marine. This is a Buyer's Guide. Did you say there's no video? No, no, okay. I'm not showing the video. Okay, I, then I can't make it work. So I apologize. I can see it. <laughs> no, you know what? Maybe I can make it work. Let me let me try and reopen this up again. This is a very cumbersome thing, and I'm getting to the bottom of it, but I don't. I'm not there yet. Okay. Um, so. I'm going to try it one more time here, see if it works. No. No? No. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I guess that's it then. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid that would be the case, but, you know, you never know. Right, good attempt. You know, well, I tell you, it, it's interesting because it works when we're, you know, when, we, uh, when we're running it ourselves, but we're right. working it through your system. So how about if you are uh, going to purchase your first time GPS unit buyer, you know, you know that um, say you're going to get something that is mountable, but you can take, take, you know, take the unit off of your boat. So you know that you want that, um, you know, what are some tips? Where should you go? I saw that, you know, that was a West Marines buyer guide, but um you know, where do you start besides just looking on the internet? Where can you get good advice to find what you need? Well, I, I'll start, and Doug, you can pick up. Um, Go ahead. Any of the high, uh, any of the high end or well known uh, national distributors like West Marine, but others, um, Cabello's and the rest of those guys, um, all sell these. Uh, and uh, the question is, you know, how much are you going to spend? Um, I can tell you this about West Marine, and, I, and I, I only can speak from several stores that I do business with. They are perfectly happy to let you play with the equipment. Just come on in and mess with it. And most of these have uh, like a, um, a, they have the ability to make believe that they're in a boat, you know, and they, we turn them on, you, you, can, you can try a lot of different things on them. Also, I have found this to be the case, but I don't know, I can't speak to all other users, that they are um, willing to stand by and talk to you about it if you, if you want them to, or leave you alone with the unit if you want them to. So I find that to be very helpful. It all depends on what kind of a buyer you are. You know, if, if, if money's no object, you can just go in and tell them what you want and they'll put it up on the counter and, and ring, you, ring it out. Uh, if money's an object and you really want to pick over things, uh, then that's a little bit different. Um, and also, if remembering too, if if your boat is a 17 footer, you don't need the ten thousand dollar unit. You know, it's uh, you can you can certainly get by with um, with a like a five inch screen, uh, and um, and that'll run you maybe six hundred dollars, something like that. The prices are based on the number of features that they have and the size of the screen. And that's really the, that's really the whole key. Yeah, Doug, you you know, any... I'm just going to say, you can really get, Walmart has these, uh, Target has the Sportsman Warehouse, any of your marinas, any of your boat dealers have tie-ins. And you know, when you're buying a boat and you want to get a, a chart clutter, you buy it all at the same time if you want, and they will install it and tell you how to operate it. So it depends on what your capability is, whether you can outfit it yourself or you want somebody else to do it for you. And that should be one of the decisions you make on what you buy and where you buy it. That's a good point because um, the, the, little, the little bitty ones, the, the, you know, the pocket size and so forth, basically they just plug in. 
they, they you know they, they got everything you don't have to do much of anything with them but then as soon as you get something that needs to be installed and it's got to have 12 volts mm. pure and it's got you know you can't have it clicking on and off and stuff like that this is an electronic piece of equipment and it needs to be maintained so just so you know fantastic good advice um, have any any other chat questions another question related to um loran c which i do remember as well as a boater so we talked about you talked about some of the uh, higher level advantages, such as, you know, running off of radio frequency, it's harder to interfere with. Um, but as an individual boater, you can you think back to where there was there any advantages to, uh, to the to the boater over modern GPS signals, given that the accuracy um, range is wider, anything about the display or the information that Lorenzi offered? Well, it's more on the, the Lorenzi system is out. So the enhanced Loran, enhanced, which is the successor to, to Lorenzi. It, it's interesting, the area I'm in right now, we still have the ground patch for a Lorenzi transmit station uh, in the Federal Point area of, near Wilmington, uh, which is still owned by the, the government. So I assume they can reactivate it. But Loran C, I, when I was first boating down in this area, I was using a Loran C and, and it was fun to try and make it work, but I wasn't very good at it. Um, the, the reason they're talking about these new systems, uh, the PNT systems is basically as a backup to GPS. It is not as accurate as GPS. It is not as user friendly as G GPS would be when you're tying them into chart plotters and other things like that. Uh, so it's a question of, you know, if we lose our GPS capability and we have not already planned on a second system, then it, you know, it's not as accurate. We, we talked about that already that, you know, if you're within 60 or 300 feet, it's kind of like the old Loran. Um, see, it's just not as an accurate thing, but we got to have some backup I mean, when you're at sea and we lose a bunch of satellites and your GPS is now offline, you may be back to a sextant in charts. Right. Yeah, to be clear about it, and, and I think you have been, but I just want to un underscore it. You know, GPS is all satellite driven and Loran was off of towers. So, you know, the, it was more local. I, I, I remember um, uh, being, I, I was the... Um, on a, on a racing boat in uh, Lake Michigan on the Mackinac races. And um, we, we used Loran because there wasn't any GPS that was available for us then. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, you knew where the towers were and you knew where all the lines were on your chart. So there, that's, that's, what you, that's how you figured out where you were. I would call it, it's a more of a hardened system than the GPS system. Yep. But it's it's just not user friendly and it's not as accurate uh, as we're all well aware. You know, with proper GPS, you can about put something in a trash can if you want. <laughs> right, that under underscores the importance of having redundant systems. Right, when one system fails, that you are not adrift without a clue. Right, having redundant systems, and hopefully our our. Um, shipmates and sea scouts that have tuned in previously, this does also drive home the port, the uh, the point of um, paper charts, right? That we that we practice our charting skills, and so that you have the information to enter into your chart plotters, but that you have your chart course already on board before you ever before ever you turn on the uh, turn on the GPS. All right. Well, we're getting to our 10 o'clock hour Eastern time. So that is our one hour. I want to thank both Dane and Doug for an outstanding presentation on GPS. And I hope that you will join us on August 23rd for the next Tech Talk, Paddlecraft Safety. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This has been fantastic.